Hey, everybody, I'm Stuart Schlossman, president and founder of MS Views and News. I, too, am, am an, an MS patient. I'm here tonight with Megan Weigel. Megan's going to be speaking about the eight pillars of wellness. I wear my mask always when we start a program, only because I want to show you all that I, too, wear a mask. And, yes, I do wear them like everywhere I go, which is really only between South Florida and Central Florida to come up here and do these programs from our studio. So this is an MS Views and News program. You can see on the screen behind me, it's MS Views and News. We are supported for tonight's program by Bristol Myers Squibb and Novartis. And Megan, Megan is a, she's a direct, she's a doctor of nurse practitioner. She's a nurse practitioner specializing in neurological care in Jacksonville Beach, Florida, where she brings a unique integrative medicine and holistic nursing perspective to her practice. First Coast Integrative Medicine. She earned her doctorate of nursing practice from the University of Florida, where her, where her research emphasis was on preventative health care. Megan's going to be speaking for about 30, 35 minutes, and then we are going to do Q&A. And let's let Megan get started. Okay. Yeah, there sounds go, great. It's Thanks, Stuart. You. All right, I'll All be right, back. So, thanks. So welcome, everybody. Um, we are going to talk tonight about the importance of eight pillars for optimal brain health in MS. Um, and I hope that you leave tonight with some good information, a couple of nuggets to tuck in your pocket to improve your lifestyle and your brain health. So next slide, Bill. We'll move through discussing the concept of neurological reserve, what brain health actually means, and then what it means in MS, and then how healthy lifestyle changes can improve your brain health. Next slide. So what is neurological reserve? We talk a lot about neuroplasticity, but what is actually neurological reserve? It's the capacity for one brain region to compensate for damage in another area. Um, and so neuroplasticity, we can move to the next slide. Neuroplasticity um, is the way that happens. Neurological reserve is how capable your brain is of allowing neuroplasticity to happen. And that brings us to brain health. So when we talk about brain health um, in the general sense of the term, most people are usually talking about things that you can do to decrease your risk of dementia, specifically of Alzheimer's dementia. Um, it was a movement that was initiated because of the associated increased risk between modifiable diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes, and obesity, and dementia. So what's important to understand about this is these vascular comorbidities that I just mentioned, specifically high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, and there are others, actually increase your risk of disability in MS and increase your risk of achieving a higher level of disability faster in MS and increase the length of time with which it takes you to achieve a diagnosis of MS if you haven't gotten that diagnosis yet. So in MS, improving brain health not only improves your overall health, but it may have the potential to improve MS progression as well as symptoms. We can move on. So neuroplasticity, I mentioned, it's a general umbrella term that refers to the brain's ability to modify, change, and adapt both structure and function throughout life and in response to experience. It's influenced by intrinsic, meaning your body's internal uh, environment, and extrinsic, extrinsic, meaning what you are exposed to externally, factors. So guess, guess which ones it's influenced by? Well, it's influenced by mental challenge. It's influenced by exercise. Exercise also actually causes neurogenesis, which is like brain cell growth, nerve cell growth. It's influenced by nutrition, specifically anti or on, on the bad side of the coin, pro-inflammatory foods. It's influenced by caloric restriction, like fasting, and it's influenced by high omega-3s and on and on and on. 
it's influenced by TLC, meaning, you know, a loving, being in loving relationships with others, having social uh, interaction, taking good care of yourself, your mind, your body, your spirit. It's influenced by sleep, and it's also influenced by meditation. Can go on. So you won't find a different answer when you're talking about brain health in MS as opposed to brain health in other things. Brain health is brain health is brain health, and that's the bottom line. Um, your risk for um, many different conditions, not just neurological ones, cardiovascular, cancer, are all related to the things that I'll talk about tonight. Next slide. So these are the six pillars. We're going to talk about eight. <laughs> these are the six pillars of brain health that the Cleveland Clinic has identified and discusses um, in regards to uh, risk of dementia. So moving your body, eating healthfully, controlling your risk factors like other medical conditions, sleeping well, keeping mentally sharp, and staying connected. And you can actually take a quiz at the website listed on the top, the little picture on the top of this slide here, healthybrains.org. You can take a quiz and they will give you a little printout of how well you're doing in each of these areas and things that you can do to improve. I highly encourage you to do it. Um, it's quick, maybe takes about five minutes, 10 minutes to fill out. You do have to put in, I think, your name, your age, and your email address um, because it is part of a study, but it's worth your time. So I would highly encourage you to do that. Next slide. So brain health and MS, how do we assess that? Well, we assess it by looking at your MRI. We look for T2 hyperintensities or white spots, plaques, scars, we also call them. We look for enhancing lesions, which are a sign of disease activity and inflammation at that very moment. We look for T1 hypodensities, which we also call black holes. And these are um, areas where there has been axonal transection and nerve loss, so nerve cell death, there's no more tissue there. We look for brain atrophy, which is the accumulation of repetitive injury to tissue and then the brain kind of resorbing that tissue and getting smaller. We look for spinal cord atrophy, which is again, accumulation of repetitive injury to that tissue. So we often see that in people who are um, into a, a disease progression and have had multiple spinal cord lesions. We also assess brain health by a history and physical. Are you having symptom worsening? Are you having new symptoms? Are you having relapses? Do you have changes on your exam? And those changes might be with your vision, the way you feel, the way you move, the way you balance, the way you think whether or not you're having pain, any problems with speech or swallowing, and also by cognition. Um, and so when any of these things are awry, we think, well, how's their brain health doing? And is it MS related or could it potentially be related to something different? Next slide. So here's a look at your MRI and your brain on MS, so to speak. What we see here on uh, the slides are, on the left-hand side, we're, we're looking at um, these nerve cell bodies are the green, um, the green areas, the green ovals. And you can see that some of them aren't attached to anything. Those are areas of, of, of axonal transection. So the axon um, has been cut. Uh, because of inflammation and demyelination. On the right, what you see is these things even closer up, and you're seeing in the green areas uh, where the arrows are, you're seeing areas of demyelination. And then the, the green glob, let's call it the oval, like you see on the left-hand side is, is actually just a, a swollen nerve head that um, is dealing with the changes in the environment. And then you can move on, Bill. And this is how this stuff shows up on MRI. So when you have complete axonal transection, like you have on the left, you get black holes. You have nerve cell loss. There's no uh, food or energy or nutrients getting to the nerve cells anymore, and you have a black hole. On the right, if you have a demyelination, then you have a T2 hyperintensity um, or a white spot or a scar. Next slide. 
So these are typical MRI lesions and MS, and these are just some of the ways that we, uh, some of the tools that we use to assess your brain health. We have gadolinium enhancing lesions, which are um, inflammatory lesions that light up when you get that contrast in your vein. We have T2 hyper intense lesions, which are plaques or scars, kind of a snapshot of all the MS you've ever had in your life. We have infratentorial lesions, which means lesions that are below the tentorium, so brain stem, cerebellum. We have juxtacortical lesions, which are lesions that come close to gray matter um, on the cortex or the outer edges of the brain. Um, and then we have periventricular lesions, which are lesions that abut the ventricles um, or the two like kidney bean shaped uh, areas in your brain uh, where spinal fluid is, is housed and made. And then we have spinal cord lesions. Next slide. So time is brain. This used to be a phrase that was used only in stroke and some really smart um, MSologists adapted it uh, to to become a very important phrase in MS. And I know it's hard to see what's happening on these slides, but basically uh, there's a great foundation. Um, some of you probably recognize the name uh, Gavin Giovannoni. He's a physician in the UK. Um, he and, and some other wonderful people developed MS brain health. And they have listed standards for the timing of key events in the MS care pathway. And these timing of events are exceedingly important for brain health, because we know that the sooner you get started on disease modifying therapy, the more likely we are to stop the disease in its tracks. So we want to make sure that parameters are met, like how quickly are you having your first MRI after symptoms or during um, uh, or during a change? Um, how quickly are you being referred to a neurologist? How quickly are you being offered and started on disease modifying therapy, making a treatment decision? How quickly are you achieving symptom management? You can move to the next slide. And, um, and then priorities following diagnosis are things like monitoring your MS. Are you having relapses in spite of being on a disease modifying? therapy? Are you having MRI changes in spite of being on a disease modifying therapy? And so if we're looking at priorities following a diagnosis, we want a person to be on a disease modifying therapy as quickly as possible. So hopefully within, um, you know, three to six weeks of a diagnosis being made. And a lot of that has to do, as you all know, with insurance and, and um, things like that. Um, and then monitoring and support is also super important. And this standard here says every six months there should be a follow-up clinical evaluation. And in my opinion, um, if possible, I believe that that should be every three months. Um, I think six months is too long to let symptoms and questions and concerns and fears accumulate. I think that you should have greater touches with the healthcare system to achieve better quality of care. Next slide. So why are comorbidities important in MS? I talked, uh, touched a little bit on um, how vascular comorbidities affect MS a few minutes ago. Well, they worsen the course of MS. Um, in fact, having a vascular comorbidity any time in the disease course results in a progression of the EDSS, which is the mobility scale, uh, to a score of six by approximately six years sooner. And that means you're using an assistive device uh, six years sooner than you otherwise would have been um, if you develop hypertension, obesity, diabetes, um, peripheral vascular disease, uh, those uh, heart disease, those comorbidities. Also, these vascular comorbidities provide us with an additional opportunity for education, particularly for preventive education to improve your health and wellness. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard the term telomere, but it's, um, it's a part of your uh, genetic code, <laughs> part of your DNA. Um, telomere length, um, can tell us biological versus chronological age. And studies on telomere are really in their infancy, um, but there has been, um, a, there have been a couple of studies in telomere length and MS. And what they found is that shorter telomere length, which means um, your telomeres are, your chromosomes are 
not as big as they should be for your age are associated with higher disability and lower brain volume. We also know from another study that telomere length is likely to be associated with disability progression. Um, and you can move on to the next slide. Telomere length is intimately associated with general health. So again, it's just another way to know that if you're not taking care of your general health, then it's going to reflect onto your MS. So what is a vascular comorbidity? Well, in MS relevant ones that are associated with more rapid progression are diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, heart disease, and peripheral vascular disease. Next slide. So what else affects brain health and MS and why? The what else? Smoking, being dehydrated, nutrient poor diets, lack of exercise, physical and emotional stress, poor sleep, and infections. And I want you guys to think about how you feel when you're dehydrated. Bladder and bowel don't work as well. Muscle spasms get worse. Brain fog gets, gets worse. How do you feel when you're eating poorly? Same as I just mentioned. How do you feel when you're not exercising? Probably the same as I just mentioned. Fatigue gets worse. How do you feel with stress? Fatigue gets worse. Symptoms get worse. Cognition gets worse. How do you feel when you don't sleep? You know, I could go on and on and on. And very interesting, many of these things that are the what else that affects MS adversely are also things that can cause pseudo relapses. So, why does this happen? Well, these states directly or indirectly create stress in the body that disrupts just the regular copacetic way the body is meant to work. And it creates fight or flight responses that don't go away. So your body stays in this heightened state of alert, I gotta go, I'm scared, I gotta run, um, which in turn causes immune dysregulation or changes in your immune system that make you more susceptible to infection and to other issues like vascular comorbidities. Inflammation does the same thing. Um, and when your body's primed to go awry, it's going to do so. And it's going to do so um, easier than if it wasn't. And I'll give you just a quick little example, and I'm sure I'll get questions. I'm a very recent COVID survivor. I do everything right. In the six weeks prior to me getting COVID, I was sleeping about four to five hours a night because of stress and anxiety. I had a lot of decisions to make and um, I was not in a good, uh, let's say mental stress place. And I'm quite certain that that is why my body was able to allow the infection in. Um, I'm also quite certain because all of the things that I do do in my life, that that is why I only had mild illness. So that's just an example of how the what else can cause the why to happen. Next slide. So I bet a lot of you have seen this uh, picture. Uh, Dr. Steven Krieger is the creator of this MS reserve um, hypothesis or MS reserve model, not a hypothesis, because it's true, it's a model. Um, let's think of MS as a swimming pool and you've got a water level. Um, and if you look on the bottom of this picture, pictorial, you'll see um, in red optic nerve, in yellow brain stem, and in green cerebral hemispheres. When you have a high lesion burden in your optic nerve or your brain stem, you're more likely to know about it in your body than just in your cerebral hemispheres. And that's probably because of all of the connections that can take over for one another in the brain. Um, but if, you're, if your pool is full, guess what? It covers up all those areas, right? So when you have a pseudo relapse and your pool empties out a little bit, maybe because you're dehydrated or stressed or you have an infection, some of those lesions that have been there for a while are going to pop up and say, hey, what's going on? And they're going to make you worried and they're going to maybe cause symptoms to be worse or cause a symptom that you haven't had for a while to show up again. So that's why the, the premise of MS Reserve and again, lifestyle improvement is so important. Next slide. So here are my eight pillars. I have two more <laughs> than the Cleveland Clinic has for dementia. One of those extra ones is MS management. 
Um, and the other one is uh, risk factor modification. And I'm sorry, the other one is, is uh, stress management. So we have MS management, nutrition, movement, stress management, sleep, social interaction, risk factor modification, and learning new things. We can move forward and we'll go through each one of those. So to manage your MS really well, you need to keep regular checkups. MRIs are recommended annually, um, sometimes more often, depending on the course of your disease and the medication that you're taking. And we wanna know if there are changes. Do you have new symptoms or have you noticed any changes in ability to move your body, feel your body, think, all of those things? Does your disease modifying therapy work for you and for your lifestyle and does it work for your MS? Are your symptom management medications is working for you? Do you need a little tune-up from rehab? Like um, maybe your balance is worse than it was a year ago and some physical therapy would help. Or maybe you're having a hard time um, doing some activities in your home and an occupational therapist could help you. Uh, do you need any specialty referrals? If you're having bowel or bladder issues, is a urologist or a gastroenterologist someone you should see? Next slide. So nutrition, I'm not gonna to say too much about nutrition um, because I'm just gonna say these two things. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants, and the right diet for you is the one that you will follow. Um, there are so many different ways you could go down a diet for MS paths, but the bottom line is choosing a plant-based diet that's low in processed foods, uh, that's rich in nutrients is the best one for you. And if you're going to choose a specific path, most likely you're gonna choose a plant-based diet and that includes the WALS protocol. Next slide. You know, actually, Bill, can you just go back for a second? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so this is a, this picture here is the cover of a, of a book. It's a little like, checkbook size book, a little bit bigger, called Food Rules. It's written by Michael Pollan. It's about, I think it's eight or $10 on Amazon. I highly recommend it. Okay, next slide. <laughs> so movement, first of all, what do you enjoy doing? Your goal of movement is 150 minutes per week. That equals 21.4 minutes per day. You wanna move at your best time of day. You want to use cooling equipment and drink cool fluids when you're moving your body, even if you live in Antarctica, because when you move your body, your core temperature heats up and that can exacerbate your MS symptoms. It can't cause a relapse. People ask that a lot. It can just make your MS symptoms worse. If you've had an optic neuritis and you still have a little blurry vision, that vision might get blurrier when you're warm until you cool down. So that happens with exercise. Um, you can also split up exercise if you need to. The cardiovascular benefits are the same. So if 21.4 minutes tuckers you out, then do 10 in the morning and 10 later in the day. Involve your family and friends. Maybe you need help moving your body. And so one of your support partners helps you with um, passive range of motion, moving your limbs, helping you to stretch. And maybe you need some motivation. So you ask a buddy to do some exercise with you or you join a virtual group exercise program. Next slide. Stress management is incredibly important um, and we can lump um, self-care into this category, but depression and anxiety are very common in MS. Um, if you aren't asked at your provider's office about your mood, um, and about any symptoms of depression or anxiety and you feel that you have them, please share your concerns. Uh, not all providers are comfortable asking, even though that's a cop out, they should be. Um, also, there's often not enough time, also a cop out. So if you're having those feelings, please, please voice them to your healthcare provider. So how can you manage your stress? Well, if it's disrupting your life, you need to talk to a healthcare provider. Um, a referral for talk therapy um, may happen. Uh, you may be offered medication if that's needed. Um, meditation, mindfulness, and breathing are excellent ways to manage stress in the moment. Just learning to breathe in more slowly and deeply than you usually do when you feel stressed can calm down your nervous system. Exercise is a really cheap anti 
antidepressant. Um, it loads your body with feel good chemicals like dopamine. Um, get outside, get fresh air, sit in the sun for a little bit. Don't let yourself get overheated. Um, that's an excellent antidepressant as well. Decrease caffeine if you're anxious. Um, many people with MS are on stimulants, uh, wake promoting agents and take in a lot of caffeine um, via energy drinks to try to uh, decrease their level of fatigue and that can drive anxiety. Uh, decrease alcohol use. It's a central nervous system depressant. It will make you depressed and more anxious the next day. Decrease sugars and processed foods in your diet. They are also um, drug-like chemicals that can affect your mood, the way your body feels. Increase omega-3s, foods high in omega-3s like fatty fishes, uh, nuts and seeds. Increase plant foods in your diet. And just learn to say no. If you're overextended, learn to say no. Um, I just give you another good book because I it's sitting right here because I just finished it. It's called Essentialism. The author is Greg McCowan. Um, it's an excellent book to learn how to uh, figure out what is essential in your life and how to live from that. Next slide. Sleep. Oh, sleep. Um, I think that one of the greatest complaints that I receive uh, from people both in my integrative medicine practice and in my conventional practice is related to sleep, either initiation problems or maintenance problems. So you can go to sleep, but then you wake up and your mind's going, you can't get back to sleep. So here are some tips for sleep hygiene. One is avoiding the use of electronics for at least an hour before bed. Um, and if you don't, if you can't do that because you read on a handheld device, use a blue light filter. You can get like a screen protector that's a blue light filter or blue light blocking glasses while you're on that device. Um, oh, I had a misspell here. Avoid caffeine, excessive alcohol, and sugar before bed. And create a calming bedtime ritual. This might be writing in a gratitude journal, doing some gentle stretching, uh, using essential oils in a diffuser like lavender is, is very calming and sleep promoting um, and uh, trying a decaf herbal tea if it won't have you going to the bathroom all night long. Next slide. Social interaction is so hard right now. Uh, this pandemic has really um, wreaked havoc on our social lives and our abilities to be connected with other people. Um, but we know that this is important for brain health. In memory studies, people with the most social interaction show the least cognitive decline. This is in the general population. So making plans to see family um, and your closest friends right now virtually, if that is what is available to you, is important. Um, be with people safely right now. So consider virtual support groups, attend programs like this this evening, um, meet outside uh, with social distancing, with masks in very small groups. Um, take a, a big look at your, your pod or your bubble. Um, your comfort level and the size of your bubble might not be what someone else's is. Uh, so just be careful if you're meeting with people in person right now, but definitely schedule time to be with friends and family um, in, in safe ways right now. It's so important. So risk factor modi modification. Well, all the other things I just talked about help actually modify risk factors for vascular disease. You wanna make sure you're taking your medication for other medical conditions as directed. Consider food to be medicine. And I, I really mean that when I say switching to a plant-based diet that's low in processed foods, um, including sugar and alcohol uh, is incredible for your health. It doesn't mean you should stop taking medication, uh, but it can certainly put you on a road to better vascular health. See your primary care provider regularly and make sure you keep appointments with other specialists to check on your medical conditions. Next slide. 
learn new things. So people always want to know, uh, you know, what brain games should I play to make sure that um, my memory stays okay. And there's, there's just not really been any great, um, any, let's say, standout stellar um, candidate in that category. But we do know that learning new things like a language or a musical instrument helps create new protect new connections in the brain. Um, I like to recommend music therapy, um, sound therapy, sound healing, um, it really can help um, with not just connections in the brain, but also some of the emotional and creative aspects that go into having and living with MS. Take up a new form of exercise or movement. So yoga, tai chi, qigong, um, stretching, um, balance exercises, all of these things create new connections in your brain. Play like a child. Um, and, and I mean that. If you have kids or grandkids, play with them, color with them, uh, do Legos with them. It's, an, it's excellent for fine motor coordination. Um, do uh, their sensory games with them if they're toddlers. All of these things keep your brain alert, looking for new things. Read, um, and then you can always use computer-based cognitive games if that's what you choose to do. Crossword puzzles, you can, they don't have to be computer-based. Um, crossword puzzles, jigsaw puzzles, all of those things are stimulating. Next slide. So this is my final slide. And I think, um, as Stu said, we have many, many questions. Um, I love this. I love this quote. Uh, Be fearless in the pursuit of what sets your soul on fire. So this is my little guy running across this tiny bridge at our neighbor's, neighbor's house. So excited. Um, and if you can pick one area to focus on out of these eight pillars of brain health, be that excited about it and take it on. Um, you know, search for something that brings you joy. Um, I know that something can bring you joy in one of those eight pillars and just go do that thing. Thank you guys for listening and I'll take questions now. Awesome, thank you very much, Megan. That was great. Everybody give her a round of applause. Nice big virtual round of applause. Okay, I can, I can hear everybody clapping already, okay? <laughs> um, so we have online questions already, and we also have a host, a slew of questions that came in when people were initially registering for this program. Where do you want me to begin with diet, neuroplasticity, um, sexual wellness, sleeping, medication, cognition, therapies? Wherever you want. Wherever I want. Wherever okay. you want. Let's start with a little bit with diet and food then. So first okay. question is, uh, what are the best foods to help with muscle tone and strength um new, macronutrients micronutrients i mean just making sure that you're following a healthy diet if you're not getting enough protein um it it's hard for your muscle it's hard to build muscle um and so if you're following a vegan or a vegetarian diet you want to make sure that you're getting um good amounts of protein and that can come from um nuts and seeds there's actually protein and vegetables that can come from grains uh also you get fiber from grains which is great um i just did a webinar with uh, can do about uh, integrative nutrition with a wonderful nutritionist, Baldwin Sanders. Um, I'd encourage you to go take a look at that and get some really detailed uh, information. Great. Thank you. All right. So another one, I guess a little similar is what's the best way to maintain weight or lose weight when it comes to diet? Well, um, you know, the old adage that really works is calories in, calories out. <laughs> So if you're taking in more calories than you're burning, um, then you're not going to be able to lose weight. That being said, if you're not taking in enough calories, then your body is going to think that it's starving and it's going to slow down its metabolic rate. So this is very, very dependent on each person, on your history of, of dieting. People who have a history of yo-yo dieting throughout their lives have a, a harder time losing weight because their bodies just get honestly sick of it. <laughs> um, your organs need a certain number of calories uh, per day in order to function. Um, so this is one of those things where I would, um, if, if you think you're doing all the right things and you still can't lose weight, I would see a nutritionist. Okay, great. Thank you for that. 
Mm-hmm. Is there a correlation between the digestion of foods containing sugar and the inability of the bladder to function properly? Um, foods high in sugar can irritate a spazzy bladder. So the answer is yes. Okay. Is the autoimmune protocol a credible diet? I don't know if you yeah, know. Yeah, so I think if that if you're referring to Dr. Amy Myers, um, I do really, uh, I actually have the cookbook in my kitchen. I got it for my mom who has lupus. Um, I think that it is a, it is a plant-based diet, um, and I think that it's a, an excellent um, resource to draw from. Okay, thank you. So there are mm-hmm. questions about the keto diet, the swank diet, the Walls Protocol. Can you um, sum all of it up and tell people what yeah, the, you think? Yeah, the right diet for MS is the one that you're going to follow. Right. I'll just say that again. Um, the There's um, minimal large studies in MS looking at uh, diet, um, none of the, like the Walls Protocol, the Swank Diet, um, diets high in omega-3s, the ketogenic diet, the MIND diet, um, none of these have actually been proved to modify the disease, but they all have pretty good statistics for improving symptoms like fatigue, um, improving a sense of wellness, um, also function, bowel and bladder function, um, the MIND diet, M-I-N-D, which has been studied in Alzheimer's. It's a combination of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet, has a small study in MS that showed a decreased um, thalamic atrophy, so decreased brain atrophy when you're following a diet like that. So as long as the diet is plant-based and very high in nutrients, that's the way to go. Choose your poison. I'm going to give you a couple more of uh, these diet and food uh, questions, and then we're going to switch on to something else. So one person writes, though, that they're on a fixed income, but they Mm -hmm. need to eat better. And what are the best types of foods they can eat with a limited income? Yeah, so I would check out. um, So fresh fruits and vegetables can be super expensive. Um, I would check out two lists online. You can just Google the Clean 15 and the dirty dozen. So the dirty dozen are foods that you should buy organic if you can. The clean 15 are foods that you don't have to worry about buying organically. A lot of people spend too much money on organic food when they don't need to be. So I would start there. I would also consider um, buying frozen fruits and vegetables just in that regard. Um, I would look for sales um, of fruits and vegetables that are in season and clean them and freeze them. Um, soups can be a great cheap way to get in a lot of, of, of vegetables. Um, and I think the bottom line is that if you are choosing foods that I don't know where you went, Stu, right here. Um, okay. If you are choosing foods that are healthful, even if you can't get the best quality, it's still better than eating highly processed foods or fast foods. So do the best you can. I, I I turned down my screens because people want to see you. They don't want to see me. Oh. I was a little okay. scared. Next. No, no, no. I'm not going to leave you alone, all right? Uh, which are your recommended supplements? I, I know you spoke about something earlier, but um, what would be your top, like, five to recommend? Um, I'm actually not a big supplement uh, person unless a person has a deficiency. So in MS, the number one recommendation is vitamin D3, and I recommend that you get your level checked before you start taking it, so you take an appropriate dose. Uh, The next supplement I would recommend is a plant-based whole foods diet, because then you probably don't need to take a lot of supplements. Um, The next one I would look into would be B vitamins. So you can also have these levels measured um, to make sure that you're not B12 deficient or folic acid deficient, B6 deficient. Um, The third one is magnesium, excellent for uh, sleep, anxiety, muscle tension, cardiovascular health, um, constipation, oh my gosh. Um, So those are the most common supplements that I recommend. So when you t- when you when you were talking about D3, you said they should get their levels checked. 
You talking about their equilibrium? You talking about blood? Yeah, so a blood test. <laughs> uh, blood test looking at vitamin D twenty five comma O H. Very good. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to take a couple of questions that I see coming in online uh, okay. about the book that you were speaking about, Essentialism. Essentialism. Uh, thank you. Yes, that one. Uh, can you please? I'm not getting paid. <laughs> somebody was asking about the author's name. OK, well, it's right there on the bottom. Greg McKeon, it looks like. Yep. Greg McKeon, McCowan. Not okay. sure how you say it. Great exactly. book. And Easy then, read. OK. And then another person was asking uh, to repeat the name of the book. OK, is that what you is that was that for stress so that everybody else knows? Oh, yeah. I mean, I would say so for me, one of my greatest problems is that I do too much and I say yes to too many things. And so this that causes me stress and anxiety. This book was incredibly helpful for me. OK, great. Thank you for that. All I'll right, never say no to Stu, but sure. Next question <laughs> is about, um, let's see, we have neuroplasticity. What is brain plasticity? Same thing as neuroplasticity. So, you know, brain reserve is um, your body's, let's call it your brain's ability to be neuroplastic, which means form new connections, um, have regions of the brain that typically don't do something take over for a function that is lost okay great so would you explain neuroplasticity and how it affects us and the lesions and does it matter if lesions increase if you don't feel symptoms okay so two questions there so um lesions cause loss of nerve tissue or damage to nerve tissue and those lesions depending on where they are in your brain affect your ability to function um, so neuroplasticity um, or an improving brain reserve through better brain health can help your brain rewire um, so that you have less effects or that you're able to recover more from the effects of where a lesion might be if lesions are increasing in size and in number or or in number and you don't feel it in your body, you don't have increasing symptoms, it's just as concerning as if you did have increasing symptoms because that is brain tissue, time is brain, and it's still damaged to your brain. Okay, thank you. Now, from online, we have uh, Karen wants to know your thoughts on fasting. Yeah, so um, fast, people like fasting um, for the same reasons that they like the ketogenic diet um, or like the WALS protocol uh, can cause some ketosis and that's because it increases, it's thought to increase mitochondrial health. So it causes a little bit of stress to your body um, that increases the, the ability of your mitochondria to make and use energy. Um, I actually, um, I'm a fan of an overnight fast and it, it's kind of funny because in traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurveda, which those forms of medicine have been around for thousands of years, they recommend that you don't eat dinner after five or six o'clock and that you don't eat breakfast until about seven in the morning. And that's an overnight fast of about 12 to 14 hours. So it's kind of funny. It's just what we're supposed to be doing. It's not actually a thing. It's just healthy. You shouldn't eat dinner at nine o'clock and then snack on Hershey Kisses until you go to bed at midnight and then wake up at six and have a sausage biscuit. Okay, great. Sorry, sorry for jumping back into uh, diet when I was on neuroplasticity. I don't know. Well, what it's, no, it's good. I mean, I think for people who um, you can eat uh, a very well-rounded, healthy diet and do an overnight fast of 12 to 13 hours, assuming you don't have diabetes or other medical conditions that prevent it. Um, and just making that change can actually cause changes in your health. Sure. Thank you. Um, so going back to neuroplasticity, though, will my MS decrease, decrease, I, I don't know this, will my MS decrease, will my MS decrease my neuroplasticity? So the thought is that, yes, if you um, 
the worse your MS is, the less brain reserve you have. Um, and therefore, the connections your brain has to, to be neuroplastic are less. Um, that being said, the caveat I'll throw in there is that some people are better at remyelinating and are, are, are better at um, neuroplasticity than others, and we don't understand all of those processes yet. But the whole point of this is that increasing brain health improves brain reserve, which hopefully improves neuroplasticity. And by doing that, you're doing good things for your MS. Great. Thank you. All right. <laughs> next, um, what is the best method for controlling and reducing muscle, muscle spasticity, medicine or CBD oil or stretching or heat? Um, I'd say all of the above. So first of all, dehydration is going to worsen spasticity. So you want to make sure that you're staying well hydrated. Um, I think a referral to a physical therapist to help with appropriate stretching is can also be effective. Um, exercise that is tolerable for you can help to improve spasticity. Um, Oral cannabinoid extracts have been shown to improve spasticity, um, the subjective, like your symptom of spasticity, um, especially if you haven't responded to medication. And then muscle uh, muscle relaxants can be effective. They, they just tend to have side effects like drowsiness. So all of the above, you know, heat, if heat works for you, great. Thank you for answering that. Now. Just sticking with the CBD question, we've had uh -huh. people come to us asking about um, smoking or using the gummies or vaping or I don't even remember what else there was. But what do you what do you what have you heard is the safest for them to be using? I mean, it sounds like you're talking about medical cannabis, THC. Yeah, yeah, which is THC. Um, we I, I don't recommend smoking. Um, one of the problems with vaping is that we truly don't know the effects of the oil and whether like how that accumulates in lung tissue right now so uh, but that being said um vaping is probably safer than smoking and you're going to realize the effects of vaping um without having to go through the gut so if you're um Say, for example, you are, are choosing to use an edible that has THC in it, um, it's going to have it's going to be influenced by the fat, what you ate before, how much fat you have, um, you know, literally, like, are you made up of more fat or more water? And it can take a while for the effects to set in. So if you have a CBD gummy and you don't have effects from it in an hour, and so you eat another one, and and then you end up in the ER, hallucinating yeah. or throwing up. So yeah. we tend to, to recommend for ease of dosing. Um, I like to recommend um, vaping over ingesting. Okay, thank you for that. All right. So next, um, can you how can you tell if if spasticity is actually happening in the legs? How do you know if it's spasticity uh, versus muscle cramps? Um, well, spasticity, I mean, muscle cramps are spasticity that comes and goes. Um, spasticity tends to kind of stick around. It's like a baseline hum, you know. Um, a cramp is like a Charlie horse and then it's gone, right? Like it happens and then it's gone. Um, people describe spasticity as, as a heavy feeling or feeling of squeezing or tightening, or maybe they can't um, straighten their legs all the way. On exam, it feels like I can't pull you. There, It feels like a really super tight rubber band or TheraBand is either in your inner thigh muscles or underneath your hamstring. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Next, what do we have here? Um, I'll, I don't understand one of those questions, so I'm going to stay away from that for a moment. Another person writes, I've increasingly declined with walking. When I begin to lean forward, it's difficult not to fall forward. At times I do fall. I don't know if it has anything to do with the MS hug. That's like Is that it? Different things. 
That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the uh, MS hug is uh, squeezing tightness around your chest or your abdomen, one side or both sides. I mean, if you're in terrible pain and, and you're falling down because of it, that's one thing. Um, if you are leaning more forward, um, it could be from poor core strength, uh, muscle spasm in the back, or from pain, or from arthritis or scoliosis, in addition to MS. So uh, that's someone who I would say go immediately to make an appointment with your neurologist and get a referral to physical therapy. Thank you. All right, next, uh, exercise, wellness. Uh, what strategies do you have for promoting wellness principles with your patients? Um, I mean, I see my patients pretty frequently. I have a small um, concierge practice, so I'm available um, to my patients on, on the regular. <laughs> so sometimes people will, you know, just say, hey, I'm having a hard time, and I get back to them. Um, other strategies I use are to uh, refer people to physical therapy or to exercise, uh, like to a personal trainer, um, even to a health coach for a little bit of cheerleading. Um, I encourage people to make smart goals, which are um, achievable, simple, manageable, realistic goals, um, and to just focus on those on a weekly basis. And exercise can be one of those things. If you're not exercising, it's unrealistic, and you're setting yourself up for failure to tell yourself that you're going to exercise for an hour a day for five days this week. Just start with 10 minutes, three days a week. Awesome. Yeah. So, so for those that are on this, on this um, web call and you have questions, I need you to write out really your entire question because there are a few people that are writing out three or four words, and I really have no idea what you're trying to say. So if you can write out a full question, that would be great. I wish I were a mind reader, but then I wouldn't be here because I would have won the lottery, all right? So we got to go beyond that, though. So please give me full questions. Otherwise, I'm just canceling out what you are trying to say. All right, next. Is, there regular, ex is, it, is regular exercise beneficial for MS patients, or should they follow some other special exercise practice? Tell me that again. Yeah. Is regular exercise beneficial for MS patients? What that means, I don't know. But or should they follow a special exercise practice for MS patients? Oh, I think I understand. So um, I. It's I not say, Jack Lorraine. Yeah. I, I would say it depends on what your abilities are um, and what you have problems with and what your uh, what your symptoms are. Um, some people with MS need no modifications, including heat. They tolerate heat just fine. Some people with MS need no modifications but can't tolerate heat. And then some people with MS need modifications. So I think you really um, need to consider your symptoms. Talk to a physical therapist. Physical therapists can be utilized to help you develop a home exercise program. Um, and then there are really great uh, MS driven workout uh programs online like my ms gym ms workouts dr gretchen holly who speaks for you all the time um, they do a really wonderful job of creating ms specific workouts if you do have different needs great thank you all right let's yeah. go back uh, let's go back to spasticity for a minute because michael sent me a really long question so that's good thank you michael um he writes uh my muscle issue feels like spasticity although it's at night, it's at night and comes and goes. It's very painful and lasts for a few minutes. What can you tell me that I could do for this? Um, well, I would talk to your neurologist. Um, it could be spasticity. It could be, it even sounds a little bit like restless leg. Um, so you would need a good exam and a good history to determine what the next best steps might be for you. Okay, thank you. For those that are beginning to ask COVID-related questions, I'm getting there, all right? I'm getting there. We're going to save that more towards the end. All right. Next, um, a person, Diana, writes, I heard you teach MS yogis. Can you tell us how we can get connected to that? Yes, please. Um, so we have free, uh, now three free MS classes, uh, three free yoga classes for people living with MS each week. 
you go to www.oms, like OM S or O M S, uh, yoga.org. So omsyoga.org. There's a tab at the far right of the website that says live stream. Click on that tab and you'll get a list of the classes as well as a link. Uh, it will take you to another website where you sign a waiver and then you can sign up for the classes. They're free. If you can't make it, you don't have to cancel. It's okay. Um, well, we're all there anyway. So we'd love to see you. Great. And for anybody that did not understand OMS Yoga, you can just send me a message and I will send you the link for it. Okay. All right, so what do we have next? We have Robin who writes, speaking of diets, have you heard of Optavia, O-P-T-A-V-I-A? -A? It's similar to keto, I, I guess. I'll, I'll say. just say, okay. I'll say yes. <laughs> okay. um, it's, it's not, where did I go? Oh, gosh, okay. It's not keto. Um, it's, um, it's, it's a prepared food plan. Um, that is, um, they have different levels of the plan. Um, and depending on the level also depends on how much of your own food that you're eating. Um, I have known several people uh, with and without MS to have weight loss success with this because it's portion, it's, you know, pre-made, pre-portioned. Um, I am not a fan of pre-made packaged foods. I think that there are, um, you know, there are chemicals and preservatives and things like that. So I, but I think if it's something that you're going to do for short term, um, I have heard success, success stories from it. Great, thank you. I think it's also, probably more healthy than like, you know, uh, Jenny Craig and Nutrisystem and a lot of those things are high in sodium. I, I you know, I haven't evaluated, I'll, I'll say I have not evaluated the ingredients of all of their foods, but they, they are highly packaged. So I'm gonna let you know, I have been on Nutrisystem since May 1st. And nice. I lost 22 pounds. That's amazing, that's amazing. That's awesome. so, so what I will say is that most of these programs now really are encouraging people to eat healthfully um, and to incorporate real whole foods into their really? diets. And they're also really great for folks who need a program. They right. need like, this is what you eat at eight in the morning. This is what you eat at noon. This is your snack. This is what you can make for dinner. Right. And if you're one of those people, I think it's a, it's a fair program. It is, um, to do Nutrisystem was fun. It's boring as hell. I'm telling you, it is boring to eat the same. I'm a I'm a pescatarian, so there's really limited of what you can get from them, and it's like five different things that you can have for dinner, or five different things that you could have for lunch. But you learn to eat real food, and you learn to eat the correct calorie count, though, of what I should be eating. Yep. And and I can feel when it you need the burn to get a little bit more calories in there. But otherwise, I'm filled with energy still, okay, and I'm yeah, and I've lost 22 pounds. So I've reached my first goal, and now I my next goal is just to hang out here for a little while, and then I want to lose another 10 or 15 pounds more. Yeah, so that's amazing. It's yeah, doable. I think you can. You just have to um, you have to pick pick the program that works for you, and then you know, sure, stick with it. Don't worry about like, oh my God, is there something better for me? Just stick with it. Right. And just so everybody knows, it didn't do anything the first month. And I was really, really upset. But then all of a sudden, it just kicked in and went. And I was like, wow, this is great. I'm going to stay with this. All right. But right now, for the last week, I've just been eating normal food. But I know how much I can eat or get away with. And I don't eat junk. All right. I learned popcorn's a great snack. Okay. Next. Uh, please suggest how to maintain sexual wellness in marriage with multiple sclerosis. That's a good one for you. Well, that's another webinar. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, the, I'll say one word, communicate. Okay. Next. Yeah, and the, uh, let me say two, two other words. Um, if you that's have good. bowel or that's bladder fine. issues, take care of those. Um, you know, even if you have to, you know, go to the doctor to, to get some help. Um, uh, and then, yeah, have fun. 
Exactly. Two words. Yeah. Have fun. Right. Okay. Do most people living with MS have sleeping problems? Um, I don't know about most, but many people do. I think many people, period, you many are, people right. living have sleeping problems. Exactly. Um, exactly. Many people living with MS do as well. Um, sleep apnea, uh, both obstructive and central, happens in MS. So the answer is yes. Great. Perfect. Do you know what could be the best exercise to strengthen your core? Um, so dependent on the individual and how they're using their lower body, whether or not they have uh, middle or lower back pain. Um, I guess one of my favorites that anyone can do without being hurt is to lie flat on your back, bend your knees so your feet are flat on the floor. Um, if you don't have good leg control, you can have someone hold them for you. And then you simply press your lower back into the floor, hold it for three seconds, let it go, and do that, you know, 10 to 15 times. Great. Perfect. So before I get on with some questions, there are people asking me, though, about, like, what are our next programs? And, yeah, I normally do say that all at the beginning or all at the end, but I'm just going to let you know now. Tomorrow night we're doing MS Hub. And that is that I'll be interviewing two people from the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation who will speak with you all about all the services, resources, grants, and programs that they're doing for the MS community. And then next Thursday night, I think it is the 17th, I and Dr. Boster will be on and we're going to be, we're going to be ridiculing each other. He's going to be teaching you about COVID and he and I just have fun poking at each other. I did forget that he and I are doing something on Saturday off of his Zoom channel where he's going to play MS neurologist and I'm going to play patient and we're going to have a real telehealth call and we're doing this with me having whatever problems I am having with MS for all of you. Yeah, I'm going public with all of it, all right? But we're doing that on purpose. We did this at the beginning of the pandemic and we're doing it again on this Saturday and forever, for anybody on here right now that wants to know about it, send me an email or send me a message somehow and I'll get you the link for it. I don't have it in front of me at the very moment. All right, but that's, that is what's going on. All right, next, important question about medication from somebody who says that she or he's been on Copaxone for over 25 years, and how would they decide to quit or should they not? I, w I mean, I can't make that decision. They'd have to talk to their neurologist. Um, the decision to stop would be based on um, what their, MS changes had looked like within the past year or two from the point of mobility, symptom worsening, cognitive function, whether or not they're still having relapses, whether or not they've had MRI changes. Um, it's a tough decision and it can't be made just by age. True. What about, um, so another person is asking if there's, um, well, again, going back to the age thing, they want to know if there's an age that they should stop taking a disease-modifying therapy. No, so DISCO-MS, which is the trial that looks at stopping disease-modifying therapy at a certain age, I think in the trial it's 55, which is really young. Um, uh, some preliminary uh, results suggest that the body's less inflammatory um, as you get older. But some people are diagnosed with MS when they're 50. Um, some people's biological age is not their chronological age. Um, so I eagerly await the final results of the trial. I think I think they're due like in early 2021 or fall 2021. Hey, buddy. Hi. Um, the naked toddler. Naked I'll keep the toddler. camera. We I'll don't want the camera to camera right now. No, we don't. No, um, we don't. But um, uh, I would say it's it's a it's a highly individualized question. Okay. You very strong, buddy. Okay. The naked strong guy got it. Um, yeah. All right. Um, moving on here. How can I know about MS lesions on the brain or from the MRI? How can they learn more about actual lesions and where they're located? Um, ask your neurologist to show you your MRI. Great, thank you. All yeah. right, therapies. What are your thoughts on culturally expanded core tissue derived mesenchymal stem cells for 
us MS patients for or um, for use in MS patients? I mean, I I, I can only speak to um, mesenchymal stem cell therapies. Uh, I know more about um, HSCT, um, hematopoietic stem cell therapy, than mm -hmm. I do about mes. So, um, you know, my thoughts are that with stem cell therapies with appropriate pre-therapy, um, I'm not sure um, what culturally, what was it? Cult um, culturally expanded cord tissue. Culturally, oh, like a oh, cord, not cord. core. No, not um, core. I, yeah, so umbilical cord tissue that's expanded in culture. Um, I'm going to have to um, plead the fifth on that. I don't know enough about it to answer. Okay. Sounds um, good. Um, as far as well, I didn't hear you at the end there. You you faded out. Oh, as as far as HSCT goes, um, the good trials we have that have ended and published about it so far suggest that it is a very effective uh, treatment for people in with with inflammatory, highly inflammatory early relapsing MS. Okay, thank you. All right, how can I get more pain relief in a natural way? Is it possible? I believe so. Um, I work with my patients to um, use mindfulness therapies to help with pain, like guided meditation. Um, Kaiser Permanente, the healthcare system out in California, has some great free podcasts. You can just Google Kaiser, K-A-I-S-E-R podcasts, and they have a, a, like a health and wellness um, website that will come up, and there are some great ones for pain. Um, I also use essential oils um, to calm the nervous system and to block pain response. So diffusing peppermint oil um, can block uh, a neurochemical called substance P, which is something your brain uses to feel pain. So diffusing peppermint oil or um, getting it in a carrier oil and putting a little bit on your temples or on your wrists and, you know, just smelling it can be helpful. Um, I use topical, uh, prep, various topical preparations for pain um, with essential oils in them. Um, you know, following an anti-inflammatory diet, so a, a plant-based whole foods diet can help with pain. Um, I'm sure this question is leading towards um, CBD and medical cannabis because those are considered natural. And um, depending on the type of pain you have, those may be helpful. Okay. Both ingested and topically. Perfect. Thank you for those answers. Sure. Next, what are the best chair? So we only have a couple more questions and then I'm going to switch to a few COVID questions. And then Megan's going to be finished for the night because she got to go take care of that toddler running around. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and <didn't>. then, <laughs> and then at that time, we're going to welcome Paul Pelland on who's going to, he's got a fabulous, fabulous story for you to get into your mind and understand what he's going to be talking about as he relates his motorcycle to multiple sclerosis. It's pretty amazing what that motorcycle has, how it survived MS as well. All right. So um, we're going to get into that. All right. So first tell us about the best chair yoga positions or options. Gosh. Um, so again, without knowing anyone's ability level, uh, I think the best chair yoga position is to do what I call um, true north alignment um, or setting up your posture. So you sit on your chair so that your feet can touch the ground and whether or not you feel your feet, hey, you press them. Right down my nose. <laughs> oh, whether or not you feel your feet, you press them into the ground. Um, and then you uh, tuck your pelvis under just a little bit and and kind of ignites your core. You sit up real tall, bring your shoulders up to your ears and then roll them back. Um, and just doing this and, and holding in your core, you can feel um, the burn, so to speak. Um, and then you can reach your arms up overhead if you can reach your arms up. If you can't reach the arm up that you can. But just that posture, just sitting tall in your chair, feeling your feet in the ground is a great chair yoga posture. 
Can you push back in your chair a little bit so we could see what you were doing? Yeah, my house is a mess. <laughs> um, yeah, that would be great as well. So. Let's see what I can do here. So I'm just sitting in a chair with my feet on the ground. Um, and instead of sitting like this, I'm sitting up tall. Right. And instead of having my, you know, my rear out like that, I have my pelvis tucked under a little bit. And then I pull my shoulders up and roll them back. And then I maintain that same straight posture when I lift my arms up. So I really have to like zip up, try to zip up through my core. And, you know, people might not be able to lift both their arms up. They might not be able to lift either arm up above this level. But you can keep your arms here or here or one arm or whatever, whatever you can do. And that's just a great exercise for your posture. Also for for eliminating stress. It means a lot of us are like this on the computer all day long. So bring your shoulders down. Let your hands fall open on your knees. Great. And just maintain that posture. That. I don't want you to sure. be too uh, too open with this expanded view because we might have a naked toddler come running in. So be careful. Yeah, with I that. think he's in the bath now. I can hear okay. it. <laughs> that's good. That's good. I thought of it after I asked you to push back a little bit. I said, oh boy, that could have been a mistake. Yeah, it could be a big no, mistake. No, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> All right, great. Okay. Um, so what do we got? We got people asking questions um, about the. By the way, let's go back for a minute about the yoga. If anybody really wants to know more about what Megan is talking about with the yoga, really, really get get signed in with her channel that she spoke about before and get involved with doing this. I mean, even these yeah, programs that I do, even these programs that I do, I always find myself sitting straight up. OK, I'm not slouched down. I'm not sitting like this, but I'm always sitting as high up as I can. And it really does feel a lot better. So between that nutri system, I'm doing a lot better. OK. <laughs> Next. Um, all right. So going now to COVID. All right. Because we had to get here eventually. Yeah. And we're only going to do this for about five minutes. And then Paul's got to get in here. All right. And then. Um, all right. So COVID. What can you tell us about the vaccine? What are your recommendations for people to take it, not take it? Um, you know, uh, again, people are asking, are they dead or alive? And we already know they're synthetic, but you could tell them that. All right. Yeah, I mean, the, the mRNA vaccines that are being developed right now and purchased in the U.S., I think, are the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, and they are inactivated. Um, uh, they require two doses. Um, you know, they've been studied in healthy populations and actually some, in some in older people. Um, they, uh, you know, claim to not have significant um, side effects, but that the knowledge of that is only, you know, within the two to four months that they've been studied. Um, and, you know, I think that many people, um, uh, we don't we don't know how long immunity lasts from the vaccine. Is this something we're going to need to get every year? What does that mean? Um, so I think in general, the global recommendation is that people who are most vulnerable do need to get it. And those are people who are, I'm not sure if the age is 60 or 65, I haven't read it lately, but, and then people with the medical conditions that put you at greater risk for more severe COVID, like diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. Um, so the rolling out of the vaccine, um, I also don't think we know that yet. I think healthcare, frontline healthcare workers will get the first doses and, uh, you know, um, the decision to get a vaccine is very, very individualized. Um, and it, it there's uh, politics that go into it. There's, uh, uh, you know, psychology that goes into it. So I don't really feel comfortable making a global recommendation for everyone, but, um, I think that many people are waiting for the vaccine for us to get back to normal. Um, it's still not going to change the fact that we need to, you know, practice all the safe, safe measures everything. that we've been practicing for a while because not everyone is going to get the vaccine. That's quite true. But if you're vaccinated, yeah. 
you really won't have to worry about a person that comes up next to you, we hope, that might have COVID. I mean, they're not a, they're not a hundred percent perfect. Right. So correct. Yeah. Correct. So so the um, at the very beginning of this whole thing and before you know they were even even near to having a vaccine, I was telling people that you know what I what I expected that might come from this is that you may not be allowed into a movie theater unless you can prove that you've been vaccinated yeah. or to be able to fly. And even now, I heard this morning on one of the news channels. Yeah, you might need to show a card that can get you an airline ticket to get on a plane. And I, I, I was like, you know, it's crazy, but. You know, is- I, ha- I have to tell you just so you can screen the questions. <laughs> sure. I have not watched the news for the past two weeks. OK, there's a lot going I have, on. <laughs> I get, yeah, I get it. I get a New York Times. Um, uh email every day and i scan through it and if anything increases my heart rate i actually choose not to read it so i i may not be well versed on the most current uh events surrounding the politics of the vaccine i'll fill in for you if it gets asked okay (laughs) (laughs) between fox and cnn it's like incredible all right yeah okay so a person is writing her name is Betty, and she, her local neurologist told her that everybody gets the vaccine is going to get a very bad case of the flu. Is there any way to avoid this? I've never heard that. Um, there are people who have gotten the vaccine who've had flu-like symptoms, who've had high fever, who've ended up hospitalized, but right. the vaccine has nothing to do with the flu. So uh, the COVID vaccine should not cause the flu. Um, I got you. I thought you were still continuing, though. Mm -hmm. All right. Cindy wants you to know that she's so impressed by what you were talking about with your yoga that (laughs) she is going to join immediately. Yay! (laughs) Okay. So she writes, I'm with a Megan. I'm with a Megan, she wrote. And uh, she can't wait to get signed in. All right. Another person, another person's writing, can you get the shingles vaccine and avoid COVID in the same time frame? That was coming from Michael. Um, You can get the new shingles vaccine, Shingrix. It's delivered in two different doses. It's now inactivated, so it's safe for people living with MS. I don't know what he means. Um, I I don't know if you can get the COVID vaccine at the same time as the shingles vaccine. The shingles vaccine shouldn't put you at greater risk for COVID. Just trying to cover all my bases here, but I'm not sure. Exactly. It was on the news yesterday. No, I'm joking. Um, because you didn't watch the news, so I wanted to say that. <laughs> All right. So, so um, going forward, what do we have? We have one more question about COVID. How can I stay focused and upbeat during this pandemic? Just watch us. Come on. It's the way you stay yeah. upbeat and 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 yeah. focused. All right. And and not only I, that. Sorry, I, I I just have to cut you off for a second, but it's not just being on our live shows but we video record all of these and they go onto our youtube channel and if you didn't catch it all the first time you can you know find out hey when is this program going to be published well the bottom line is about two weeks all right and if it's not two weeks it's three weeks and that's only because we're doing so many of these that this guy on the other side of the table for me he's falling further and further behind and that's my video producer all right so everybody yell at bill if I'm not getting them on there quick enough, okay? So amazing. I'll give you I'll give you his email address, and you can write to him and say, get it over to Stuart and let him get it onto the YouTube channel already. All right. So another person wrote, uh, thanks, Megan. That was great. But let's get back to COVID. All right. About what is your opinion on how to keep people from getting depressed? So um, I actually prescribe limits on news watching per day um, and definitely not before bedtime. Um, I've also very recently had people um, take uh, the Facebook app off their phone um, and they found it extremely helpful. I also think something that's fun to do um, is to create like, um, I don't know, like a habit or 
a plan for something that is just it's like mundane now, right? Because we're all so sick of eating at home and getting carry out and make it fun. So like I made dinner for my husband's birthday last weekend and I set the table like, like it was Christmas day. I mean, we use China crystal and silver and it was really fun <laughs> to just like do something like that. Maybe you, um, one night a week, you dress up for dinner at home. Um, you know, just really making some plans to to change some things up in the house, given the fact that we still can't do so many things and we still can't be together. Uh, maybe you have um, a, you know, a happy hour once a week or once a month with your friends virtually or you start a book club. Just do something that you're looking forward to and as much as possible, weather permitting, get some fresh air every day. Great. Thank you for that. Unfortunately, I got to ask you one more COVID question. And this person says, okay. she wrote it in, but I don't know where she wrote it in because I don't have it here. So could you answer the question? On, da, da, da. Okay. If two people live in the same household, this is coming from Maureen. If two people live in the same household and one gets vaccinated and one doesn't, can the one that didn't get COVID from the one that was vaccinated due to the virus, can one get COVID? from the one that was vaccinated due to the viral sh shedding? No. No. It's okay. not a live virus. All right, thank you for that. So that was answered. All right, so Megan, before I say that to you, somebody wrote in, thanks, Bill. Oh my God, we gotta thank thanks, Bill, Bill for what he's been doing, Thank right? for Bill. <laughs> Great, so I'm up here with Bill um, two times, three times a week doing these programs. And we seem to be doing this like every seven to 10 days. We have been doing this since the beginning of the pandemic. And that's my way out of South Florida as I come up here to Central Florida. And yes, I'm very, very careful about all the places I go to. I have my facial fabric masks from when I'm not in the public. I have my K95s when I am in the public. And uh, if I have to stop in and use a restroom, I put on a K95. All right. And I feel a lot safer about it. And everybody should do that as well. When I'm within proximity of others, we do all wear facial masks when we're when we're even in the building. Um, and that's why I start off all these programs wearing a mask. OK, so, Megan, I want to thank you for again doing this with us. Megan yeah, is going to be back online with us on January 7th. OK, remember that, Megan, January 7th. OK.